no mai hari mai ngā tangata o motu kairanga ki te kaupapa i tēnei rā. Welcome to the people of the Eastern Ward. My name is Esther Buchholt of Soulstone and I will be your MC and your host for today. Uh, but first, as is the custom, as is the tikanga of Wellington City Council meetings, we will begin with a karakia, te whakataka te hau, a beautiful karakia um, that evokes the, the power of the natural forces uh, for this meeting. So please, uh, say it along with me or uh, read it if you would like to. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a kina kina ki uta, Ki mā tara tara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, he chio, he huka, he hauhu, te hei, mauri ora. Thank you. And let us begin. Uh, so first of all, uh, a little bit of housekeeping as we usually do in meetings. And for those of you who are new to webinars, you'll see that there's a dialogue box on your right hand side. Uh, this is for you to use, have a play with, set up the screen as you would like it. Uh, you should know that you as attendees are on mute, uh, but you can communicate with us by using the questions box. There's a tab there, drop it down and write your questions. We can start taking them now and we will be taking as many of those uh, with the panel today as we can. You'll also see a handouts tab uh, that has four pieces of information for you that you can access at any time. Um, there's uh, information about the annual plan, information about the parking policy, uh, there's today's PowerPoint uh, and an accessible version of today's PowerPoint. This webinar is being recorded, uh, so um, we will send you that link afterwards and it will also be uploaded to the Let's Talk website. Please share this with your friends and others who couldn't make it today. So our program for today is a little bit of introduction uh, and then Andy Foster, your Mayor, will be presenting to you on the annual plan, taking some questions. Uh, Jenny Condy will be presenting on the um, parking policy and take some questions. And then the second half, we will bring in your local ward councillors um, who uh, will be uh, acting as a panel uh, to answer your questions about your local community and in relation to the annual plan. So uh, that's the run plan for the today and I would just like to invite the panel in uh, to say hello and introduce themselves. Come on in. Welcome. So uh, Mayor Foster, would you like to start? Good morning everyone, uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, my name's Andy Foster, I've got the privilege of being the Mayor of this beautiful city and I'm um, looking forward to our conversation this morning. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Councillor Condi. Kia ora mai tato. I'm Jenny Condi, I've got the parking policy portfolio, so I'm here to talk to you today about parking and how we use our on street space. Kia ora. Uh, Councillor Rush. G'day folks, uh, Sean Rush here from Roseneath, live at Roseneath, so uh, happy to hear from you all today. I've heard a few comments for overnight and, and more recently, so uh, let's keep that dialogue going. Awesome. Councillor Free. Morena everybody, um, I'm Sarah Free, I live in Strathmore, I've been uh, proud to represent the eastern suburbs for six years and I'm also Andy's mm. Deputy Mayor. Mm. Kia ora. Councillor O'Neill. Morena, um, ko Neil Tokoonga. I'm one of the new uh, Timotu Kairangi councillors with my colleagues here. Mm, great, thank you very much. Uh, and so that's a little bit about us and what we're planning today. I'd like to share with you uh, what we, uh, a little bit about you as an audience. So if we could bring up the PowerPoint again and uh, we'll see you again shortly. So uh, the participants, um, so councillors, if you could just take uh, your cameras off and mute. Um, about 75% of you are from Motukairangi, uh, but we also have others from Wellington City and outside of Wellington City. Uh, that's who's here today live, uh, but also uh, we have many people watching these webinars afterwards. So if that's you, uh, Morena, kia ora, hello to you. You also asked us some, we asked us some questions. Uh, here's a few of the key themes that have emerged about the annual plan. You're very interested in facilities uh, in the COVID-19 response, uh, the viability, ageing infrastructures, and uh, a lot of interest in the parking policy and the balance between parking and cars and active modes of transport. 
You also had a lot of questions about your local community and that you see them here uh, and these will be answered by um, your panel in the second half of this um, presentation or this webinar. Not all your questions will be able to be answered today. We will take as many of them as we can, uh, but those that we can't get to or those that are of a highly technical nature, uh, we will be um, recording, answering and uploading and frequently asked questions uh, on Let's Talk. So that's enough set up for today. Uh, Andy, I'd like to hand over to you for your presentation on the annual plan. Oh, thank you. We've got uh, a poll. First, We've got a poll first. We've got a poll first. Uh, so to help Andy uh, pitch his presentation, uh, Olivia, could you launch the poll? We'd just like to know what you, the audience today, already knows about the annual plan. Have you seen it? Have you not? You had a chance to skim through it. So just tick the box that makes most sense to you. Great. Those are we... uh, votes are coming in from our audience. <laughs> now. Uh, I'm just going to give that a couple more seconds while they continue to come through. Um, and now I'm going to close that poll and share the results with you. Oh, fantastic. So about 75% of the audience, Andy, have already had a look at it. So that's a great start. Good. Good start. Okay. Over to you. Right. Thank you. Olivia, can we go to the first slide, please? Well, look, um, welcome again, everyone. It's great to have you all uh, here. So what I'm going to do is very quickly walk you through some of the key um, aspects of the um, of the annual plan. I'll put my timer on because I want to make sure that we get through in uh, in good time. Um, and so let's get straight into it. Um, first of all, uh, COVID-19's impact on Wellington. And look, we, we know it's had a significant impact on us. For, for many of us, uh, the lockdown period was simply a time that we had to spend at home. Uh, if we were able to work from home, that was one thing. Uh, but many of us, our jobs were not affected by that. Uh, however, there are many parts of our community where, the, where um, businesses and jobs have been significantly adversely affected. We're particularly thinking of uh, the retail sector, uh, sectors exposed to tourism, hospitality, arts and events, um, the uh, commercial accommodation, hotels, etc. So they've been significantly affected. What we don't know yet is how significantly affected, but we know uh, that there are a significant number of people who have been have lost jobs, and it's quite likely there will be a significant number more who will lose jobs over the next wee while, particularly as the government's wage subsidies come off. Uh, we're in regular contact with members of the business community. In fact, I had a meeting this morning with uh, with many of them, and so we know that there are some real changes current and on the horizon. And that impact is across all uh, aspects of our city life as well. So businesses, households, we, we've, we've noted down there cultural, environmental and sport. So some of us who are keen sports people very much looking forward to getting back to playing sport. At the moment we can't do that, uh, but we are just beginning to make those first steps uh, back into uh, a degree of normality, which is great. Next slide please, Olivia. So as I said, um, significant impact on the private sector uh, from COVID, but it's also had a significant effect on council, the business. So council obviously has uh, a significant proportion of our revenue comes from things like user charges, so parking fees, pool fees, gym fees, um, our venues, the dividend that we get from the airport, all of those kind of things. And we have had a significant impact on council as a business. So in the current year that we're in, that's the 2019-20 year, uh, we are expecting to lose something like $20 million in revenue between when the lockdown started at the end of March and the end of June. In the coming year, we're expecting that loss could be as high as another 50 million, so a total of about 70 million. We'll come back to that in one of the slides later on. And I want to give you a little bit of context here. So we are in the third year of our long-term plan. So that's the plan that was signed off in 2018. It's a 10-year budget. Uh, it goes 2018 to 2028. And this year coming, it's the 2020, 2021 year, we were expecting an increase and planning for an increase of 7.1%. The following year, it was going to be 6.8, year after that 6.2, and the year after that 7%. So almost 28% over the period of those four years. And that excluded investment in Let's Get Wellington Moving, excluded investment in fixing up Civic Square. It didn't anticipate extra money for the three waters. Uh, it didn't anticipate the uh, three temporary libraries in the central city, two of which are operating and one is about to uh, to come on stream uh, in July now. It's been delayed by a couple of months, obviously, because of COVID. 
uh, and it also certainly didn't contemplate $70 million in lost revenue from COVID. So if you start from that position of effectively an expectation, a planning expectation of 28% over the next four years without those things, you can see that we have a, a significant financial challenge for the council. Next slide, please. So when we, got, when we went into the lockdown situation, we wanted to respond to that as fast as possible. We knew it was going to be really tough uh, for businesses. We knew it was going to be really tough for many employees. So we wanted to react very quickly. I think we were the second council in the country to react with a comprehensive, in fact, probably more comprehensive than the first council uh, that did that uh, pandemic response and recovery plan. And so the first part of that was to try and soften the impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, and the, the lockdown on business and on the employees of those businesses. And so what we did is we said we were going to allow for uh, rates deferral. Uh, so the rates bills that you've got in the mail in the last few days, um, what we've allowed for that, if you are in the, the certain categories of businesses or you can show that as a resident you have been significantly adversely affected by COVID, then you can apply to defer your rates. And that means that instead of paying your rates by the 1st of June, you don't have to pay them until the 1st of uh, December. And uh, you don't have to pay the normal 10% penalty that you would you'd normally be up for. All we'll charge is the council's cost of borrowing, which at the moment is less than 2%. So that was the first element. The second elements there were things around fee rebates. Uh, so where we charge for things like, uh, for businesses, it was things like pavement licenses, liquor licensing fees, uh, where we were the landlord, it was the rentals there, uh, for example, pool and gym fees, all of those things have either been frozen uh, or we're simply not, we're not charging them over that period of time. Uh, in terms of the, the other part of the response was a welfare response, so we wanted to make sure that we were looking after those who were the least well off in our community, so a lot of effort went into working with uh, those who work with, for example, the homeless, um, and so we worked with the, the likes of the City Mission, uh, DCM, Soup Kitchen, etc. Did a fantastic job over this period of time, and there were uh, a significantly increased demand for those services too. So uh, we've been working very collaboratively in that area. And the other part is looking at recovery. So we've set aside some money, which would usually have gone, uh, it's not new money, but we've set aside some money for what we're calling the recovery fund. And so we're working with Wellington NZ, which is um, largely owned by Wellington City Council, uh, and the business community and the arts and culture community in particular, to try and put together a, a recovery plan so that as we come out of level two into level one, we start drawing people back to the central city. Our central city is, we think, the best central city in the country. Uh, it's the core, not only of our city, but of the region. And of course, we're the capital city. And what we need to do is to be able to draw people back into our city uh, to create support for those businesses that operate in the central city and to create that life and vitality that we all love about our city. Next slide, please, Olivia. So the second part is the draft annual plan. Um, and this is what uh, today is all about. So we've tried here to balance the, the rates impact uh, with uh, the need to continue with existing services and also to keep on the transformation that people want us, uh, want us to do. And I think if we just said, look, we, we want to do no changes at all and just leave the city exactly the way it is, uh, we wouldn't be investing in transport. We'd leave Civic Square the way it is. And we don't think that that's an acceptable proposition. We think people want to continue to change our city we're very proud of our city, we want to continue being proud of our city, we want to be at that absolutely positively Wellington. Uh, so we think we've got the balance about right. We started out with a 9.2% rates increase, and then as a result of the COVID situation, we pulled that back to 5.1, or there was an option there for 2.3, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. We think we've got the balance about right, but we want your feedback too. Uh, one of the bits we have uh, also done is we've asked the Chief Executive to do some work on trying to trim our costs, and we as council, uh, as the elected council, have also said, look, we are keen to try and help you with that as well. Next slide, please, Olivia. So this, um, the first part there, the borrowing to offset lost revenue, I've already mentioned the $20 million in 2019-20. Uh, we estimate we'll lose another $38 million in 2020-2021. Uh, in, uh, in the eastern suburbs, of course, we, uh, we are a third shareholder in the airport. We're not really expecting a dividend from the airport in the next uh, in the next 12 months. We'll, we we want we expect one dividend out of the two years, but not two. Uh, so that's you know that's around 13 or 14 million on the same. We were also going to increase a number of fees. Uh, one of those was in the building consent area, and that was to really to reflect the the high risk that we face as ratepayers uh, for working in the building consent area. And we were also going to be putting up a number of parking charges. We're not doing any of those. 
Uh, and so that equates to another $11 million. So 38 plus 11 plus the 20 I've already mentioned comes to close to $70 million. That's our estimate. If we were to charge uh, those onto rates today, we would at be adding something like another 12% onto today's rates. That clearly is not tenable, uh, especially now. Now is the rainy day, so we've chosen to borrow for that. And we think we can borrow for that because those revenues will recover over time. You know, two or three years time it might take, but they will recover over time. Whereas if we were borrowing for today's groceries, that, would be, that wouldn't be borrowing. That would simply be saying that tomorrow's ratepayers can pay for what today's ratepayers are using. So what we're going to do is we're going to spread that cost over about 10 years, that, that $70 million over about 10 years. Next slide, please, Olivia. As I said, we also need to continue to invest in the future. Um, we want a more sustainable city. We want to be a more resilient city. We did talk uh, fairly early on in the, in the lockdown period about what would happen if we had a, another disaster. Um, just because of COVID's around, it didn't mean that earthquakes wouldn't, um, wouldn't happen. And that would, have been, that would have been a real challenge. But of course, we've got to keep on thinking about the future and making sure that our city is resilient for those other challenges that we face. Um, that's both uh, seismic and also things like climate change. And we did see a substantial storm on the south coast, of course, in, in the uh, lockdown period. And also we want to invest in the overall livability of the city. We are one of the most livable cities in the world, and we want to continue building on it to make us even more livable. Some of those projects, Let's Get Wellington Moving, we're aiming to accelerate Let's Get Wellington Moving, working with our partners, Greater Wellington Regional Council, the New Zealand Transport Agency. We've put up some... Are you there, Andy? There seems to be a um, break in Andy's transmission. Um, Claire, if you would like to get hold of Andy uh, and Olivia, if you could the go. The one to our way, uh, which will open in off Lambton Quay, is as planned to open in July, and we've gone to the next the next one as well. Right, okay. Um, three Waters. We've we're proposing to invest a little bit more in this budget in the Three Waters, two point nine million dollars extra, and that's basically to do two things. One is to make sure we understand the uh, the state of our asset. Uh, obviously, we've had a few fairly high profile breakages in the last little while. Uh, one of them, including the, the Mount Albert Tunnel, which is uh, close to being uh, fixed, which is great. Um, but we've had some breakages there, and we also want to put in place a what we call a roving crew to go out and, and check what's going wrong, to find that, so we can actually um, we can actually do the work on that. Convention and exhibition centre is continuing to work. That started in about September last year, uh, and if you go past it, you'll see that a lot of uh, a lot of people working on site. That is aimed to be open in 2023. It's about 800 jobs uh, involved in the construction and the, the supply chains involved in that. St James Theatre, we are strengthening and do, uh, doing the um, uh, the air conditioning systems, etc., are being improved as well. Uh, that's due to uh, to reopen at the end of 2021, just in time for the 2022 uh, International Festival of the Arts. I've already mentioned Tanaka Civic Precinct, and there will be a paper, as I said today, which will, will get, a, a, I'm sure, a lot of interest and a lot of coverage. The town hall you see the picture of there, that the work continues on on that. Uh, Naila Lover on site there doing some great work, and that again is 2023 for it to be reopened. And I've already mentioned Let's Get Wellington Moving. The investment in Let's Get Wellington Moving is really what we're trying to do is accelerate uh, investment in things like walking, cycling, and public transport in particular at this stage. And we're also doing the business cases for the uh, state highway and the mass transit. Next one, please, Olivia. And look, there's a number of community projects which are also highlighted in the plan. Um, the first two of those are resilience projects, No Gorge Slip Repair and the Wadestown Retaining, um, Retaining Wall Resilience Upgrade. Uh, in the budget, we've included some new uh, investment in home energy audits, which fits with our desire to be a carbon neutral capital. Uh, and we've also invested uh, in weed control. Now, we're doing a fantastic job in predator control as a partner in Predator Free Wellington. Uh, obviously, Miramar is the, the, uh, the showcase uh, at the moment, and we're looking to roll that across the rest of the city. But we've never done a huge amount in the weed control area. So that's the next step in our biodiversity restoration journey. And really exciting to see the government's investment in, um, in jobs for nature uh, in the budget uh, last week. And so I've already put our hand up as a city council and said, look, we want to be part of that because we know there'll be some jobs that we need. Uh, and so if we can do something meaningful for our, for our environment at the same time, that'd be a great, a great outcome. 
And then we've also got the upgrade of some community facilities, including the Strathmore Community Centre plan. Next slide, please. And I'm just gonna finish off with the two rates options. So we've got 5.1% or 2.3%. What's the difference between the two? Well, what we do is um, every three years we revalue our assets. And the reason we do that is because the cost of, for example, replacing a pipe today is more expensive than it was, say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And it will be more expensive in you know, 20 years' time than it is today. So we need to revalue those. We use those revaluations. We then depreciate the, the assets, and that means basically we... Um, we're reflecting the aging of the asset over a period of time, and we use that depreciation funding essentially to pay for the renewals of assets, the replacements of those assets over time. So if we fund it less, that's the 2.3% option, then we're collecting less money to do that investment in, uh, in our pipes and our reservoirs, because this is specifically about the waters, the three waters network. Um, so our recommendation is going for 5.1%, because that does two things. One, it gives us the money to be able to invest in our water asset, and secondly, it means that we're not borrowing uh, to, um, to make that investment if we need to do it. I think that brings me to the end of my presentation, Esther. I'll go, go jump straight over that one. Very good, very good. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so we'd like to just run another poll uh, to check that, to help us decide which questions to take now to check that you understood the trade-offs. So uh, Olivia, could you run that poll? So just let us know whether you, under whether you understood uh, Andy's explanation about the trade-offs, not whether you agreed with them or not, but so that we don't have to go into that any deeper. So tick the one that makes most sense to you. Great, so those results are starting to come in now from our participants today. I'm just gonna give everyone a few more seconds to get <coughs> your opinion in for us and now I'm going to close that poll and share the results. Great so quite a lot of people need more time to have an opinion on that great so let's take some questions that are going to dig down uh, to help people understand those and um, have an opinion. So Diane uh, would you like to feed Andy his first question? Yep, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me okay, Esther? Yes. Yes. Yep. Terrific. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, we had a question coming from Matt just now while you were talking, and it's to do with rates rises. And I'm going to combine it with a question that Amy sent in as well. So Matt's question is, uh, we are in extraordinary times and ratepayers are going to be in the most difficult economic times of our lifetimes. And yet the council is proposing rates rise as well in excess of inflation and will not consider a rates rise. And Amy is asking about um, what would a double whammy look like if we were to uh, defer it this year and, and um, uh, carry it next year? Right, look, they're, they're, they're big complicated questions, so good, good questions. Um, so the first part of that is um, it, we could go lower. Uh, the way we would have to go lower is we would need to cut some costs. And so as a executive has been asked to, uh, to look for savings, and is doing that. Uh, and as a collective council, we've also said that we will do, we will help her with that as well. Um, so, you know, conceivably we can cut some costs. We'd certainly appreciate your views as to where we might do that. Um, so any intelligent, constructive comments are always helpful. Um, the second bit is that if we were to cut back to today, essentially, and say, well, we'll just put it on to, to next year without cutting any costs, uh, next year would look pretty unpleasant because as I said, you know, we had those essentially 7%, 7% all the way through for the next four years, which are pretty much locked in. Uh, and then we've got Let's Get One to Moving Civic Square, et cetera, on top of that. So we'd be well into dub to double digits next year, um, probably sort of 14, 15%, uh, which is not a particularly attractive proposition. So it's trying to get that, that balance right. Um, and the other part is that I should say is that if you are in a situation where you're particularly, you've been economically affected by COVID, I've already said that in the 1920 year, we are allowing for deferral of rates. We're also proposing that for the 2020-21 year. So that doesn't mean 5%, it means 100%. So it allows you potentially to put your, um, your rates bill off uh, for, you know, it might be six months. Um, and one of, the, one of the questions which uh, we kind of like people's feedback on is, let's say you've been, you've def you've been in a situation, you've had to defer your, um, your June, uh, se uh, your September and your December rates what period of time should we be allowing people to pay that back over? So two years, five years, have been 
kind of suggestions that people have been making. So we'd appreciate your feedback on that as well. Very good. Let's take a different <clears throat> annual plan question uh, now, Diane, not about the yep. trade-offs. but yep. um, Lots of people asking about Central Library. Why is fixing the Central Library not on the annual plan from Jane? And what about underground parking for the Convention Centre? Okay, two completely different questions. I'll, I'll deal with the underground parking one because it's relatively straightforward. We have provided no parking for the Convention Centre, um, so it'll be on-street parking. It's, you know, it's relatively easily accessible being, being in the centre of the city. Um, if we did provide parking, then the bill would be considerably higher than it is now because underground parking comes at a, I think, uh, average cost per car park is sort of 70, maybe even $100,000, so that, that, they don't come cheap. Uh, so that's the reason we haven't done that for the Convention Centre. Um, with respect to the Central Library, it, it kind of is in the um, annual plan. Um, what we've done is we've provided just over a million dollars for doing the planning work. Uh, and so you will see today, um, the paper will be on the Central Library will be in the public arena. It was going to be at the end of March, but unfortunately COVID got in the way. Uh, but you know, I've been very, very keen to make sure that the public get to see that. So they'll have all the engineering detail there and you'll be able to have a look at that. We'll be running an extensive public consultation on it and we really will want your, uh, your views on what we should do. And it's not just about the library, the building, it's also about the library, the service as well. Very good. And we've had a lot of questions over all of these webinars about the library um, and great to hear that there's more in-depth um, yeah. information. Yeah. Well, well one, of the th one of the things I should say is that what we're, what we're aiming to do is to try and make sure we have a, a modern 21st century library. So I kept on mm -hmm. saying, uh, you know, if, if people have been to Tupuranga, which is the Christchurch Central Library, or they've been to our new library in uh, the Waitohi, um, they you will see what a, a modern 21st century library is. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've put inside the library to make it a much more exciting, vibrant place. Fantastic. Look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you very much, Andy. There are some uh, more questions uh, about the annual plan, uh, but we will be following those up in frequently asked questions and, and, and uploading them. They're a bit more technical. Thank you. So uh, I would now like to invite uh, Councillor Condi in to come and talk to us about I'll the back off for a policy. Yep. Yep, please. We'll get you back soon. Uh, welcome, Jenny, and uh, the floor is yours. You've got about five minutes. Kia ora, thanks Esther. If I could have the next slide please, Olivia. Thanks very much. So I'm here to talk to you about the parking policy today. And this policy has been in the work for a couple of years now. And the purpose of the policy is to provide a framework for our decisions about on, mostly about on-street parking. So nothing will change on our streets as a result of this policy being adapted. It's, it's really about um, creating a framework and some transparency for how decisions will be made into the future over the next 10 years when we're looking at our on-street space and making decisions about how we're going to prioritise parking. So we, we know that we are never going to have more on-street parking than we have right now. We uh, have a lot of geographical constraints in Wellington and our roads are not that wide. We can't magically make them wider. So we have the on-street space that we have now and we have to figure out how we're going to prioritise it and what we're going to use it for. And as we make progress with projects like Let's Get Wellington Moving and try to make progress on mode shift and encouraging other kinds of transport and helping people out of their cars, that kind, those transport options need space on our roads. And so we need to be thinking about if we're using that really valuable on-street space for bus lanes, for cycleways, whether we need to be using it for parking. And if we're using it for parking, what kind of parking? Do we want to see P120 or paid parking in areas to support retail or residential parking? What are our priorities? Now the policy just covers council parking. It doesn't cover the private parking providers such as Wilson's because those are private companies and we don't have influence over their decisions. So the policy is just looking at council controlled parking and what we can influence. Council has very little off street parking. So mostly today I'm going to be talking about on street parking because that's where the main impact of this policy will be. Next slide please. So the policy, as I said, is a framework. So it's got policy objectives and principles in there that show you what are what are the things that are going to be guiding decisions about parking over the next 10 years. And do you think that we've got those things right? Um, and then we also include what we call a parking space hierarchy. And this is where in different parts of the city, we talk about what we think should have the highest priority for that on-street space. And in some parts of the city, that might be um, bus lanes and then cycleways. In other parts of the city, it might be, as I said, retail parking that's short stay to encourage people to come to our businesses. And in different parts of the city, it might be residential parking. So it goes through um, different parts of the city and says what we think should have the highest priority for the, for the limited on-street space that we have. 
The policy also sets out an approach to area-based planning of parking and a new approach to pricing and also a parking management hierarchy, which is about what are the tools we have in our toolkit when we've got a parking problem and we've got not enough parking in an area, how can we manage that problem? So I'll talk about those three next. Next slide, please. An area-based approach is, is a new approach to parking. In the past, what we've always done is essentially had a complaint about a particular street usually, and our traffic engineers go in and try and fix the problem on that street and make some changes to the street. And then what we find is we fix that little problem on the street, but the problems then spill over into the neighboring streets and the streets next to that. And then we go and chase our tail by going to the next street and fixing just that bit, and then the problems spill over again. So the idea behind an area-based approach is that we would go into perhaps a whole suburb and and look at the whole suburbs parking plan at once rather than doing piece by piece street by street another advantage of doing it this way is that we can be more holistic about how we have these conversations with the community so we can bring in other people to talk um, about the parking and transport needs of that community we don't talk about parking in isolation but we can talk about it in the context of other transport needs we can talk about it with for example major employers in the area um, we can talk about it, for example, if we were in Miramar, you obviously need to talk about the impact of the airport on how the, the, the parking functions in that suburb. Uh, so we can bring in lots of different groups who otherwise wouldn't normally be part of what would just be transport engineers making decisions about parking. And that means that we can get to some, some better decisions and actually um, look at all the other levers that we can pull in that community to, to help fix this problem rather than just the tools in our parking management toolkit. Next slide, please. The other thing that's in this paper is about a change to how we price parking. Now, again, this will not immediately result in changes to pricing on our streets as soon as the policy has been implemented. This would be a framework that would allow us to make changes in the future to go to a new style of pricing that we call demand-based pricing. So at the moment, what we do is we set pricing usually in the CBD, and those prices are the same right across the city and generally the same um, all times of day. And we don't change them very often. Um, often we only change them every few years. Sometimes we don't change them for a decade. In this case of demand-based pricing, pricing is much more variable and it changes much more quickly to respond to the demand and how much demand there is for parking. So for example, we know that in our city, parking at run the Courtney Place area is really busy and in high demand in the evenings, but less in the mornings and during the day. Whereas in Lambton Key, we know it's really, really busy during the day, but by the time you get to the evening, it's pretty much opened up. So demand-based pricing would allow us to set different prices for different times of the day and different areas of the city to help us manage that demand and mean that we could actually spread that demand out more across the city. This is something that's been uh, available in, uh, and used in other cities really successfully around the world. And closer to home, Auckland has had a demand-based pricing um, policy in place for a few years now. It's been working really well. So we'd like to hear um, your thoughts about that. Next slide, please. Finally, our management hierarchy approach. As I said, this is the toolkit that we have to use when, when someone comes to us and says, there's a real problem with parking on our street. Um, I can never find a park. What are you going to do about it? So the first thing that we can do is looking at making sure that we are increasing the monitoring and enforcement of any rules that are already in place. So we want to get our parking wardens out and make sure that people are already following whatever rules we have there at the moment. And if that's not enough to, to get on top of the problem, then we can look at some other solutions. We might look at bringing in time restrictions if there aren't time restrictions there yet. So there might be areas, for example, where um, there's a lot of pressure on people doing park and ride and they're parking on all day. We could say, okay, well, let's actually turn those parks into P120 or P240 parks so that we can free up that space for more retail and short stay parking and those commuters can have to find somewhere else to park. If that's not enough to help us with the problem, we can look at um, designations and user restrictions, and that's things like loading zones or mobility parking or residential parking, where we say this is for only for particular users that can use this area. And then, of course, we can bring in parking charging. So if there's an area that hasn't been charged in the past, parking charging is a way to we, we can introduce that and help manage the demand that way. And as I said, under demand-based pricing, if we've got somewhere where already there is a price in place, but there's still heavy demand, we can look at increasing the, the price in that area so that the demand um, shifts to other parts of the city. Finally, if we've used all of those tools in our toolkit, we can also look at trying to source alternative um, 
alternative transport modes. So that's where we come back to the area-based planning about are we providing other kinds of transport modes? Can we work with major employers in the area to see if we can allevi alleviate these problems? And if that's still not enough, we can look at how could we increase the supply off street? And that might mean working with private companies such as Wilson's or employers and other, other um, entities to see if we can provide some off street parking in an area where we really absolutely need it. But that would be the last resort after we try and manage the problem with other other tools. So uh, next slide, please. So it's, it's time for questions. And, and I just wanted to say, as I said, this is really about a framework about how we prioritise really limited public space, our on-street space. So we really do want to hear from you because it's really about what you think we should be prioritising our space um, on our streets. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, let's just take one question because I'd like to make sure that we've got as much time as possible also for the panel. So uh, make it a good one, Diane. Okay, I hope this is it. Um, this is about parking on the weekends and we've had lots of questions about that. Uh, in all of these sessions actually. So this is from Brian and it's, he's specifically asking about free parking Saturdays and Sundays, uh, mm -hmm. overnight in particular, and, um, uh, and parking meters limited to 90 minutes max. What do we think about that? That's really interesting. What we found with when we introduced the weekend charging is that it, it created the effect that we were after, which is that it increased the turnover of those parking spaces. Because what we found was before that, there were people who were generally residents often parking their car on the street all day because they didn't have to worry or they would move it every one, every every two hours, they would go and move their car. So by introducing charging, we've increase that turnover of parking. And that's the thing that's the most important for supporting businesses. We're trying to support retail and hospitality. It's about bringing in those turnovers so that they can get lots of customers through the door. So we can certainly look at if you've got some suggestions about how we might improve that turnover. But at the moment, the, our research says that the turnover is pretty good at the moment. Um, but we're always keen to hear ideas from the public about how we could do better. Great, and we'll let you know shortly uh, about how you can make those submissions. Thank you, Jenny. So I'd like to invite uh, the rest of the panel in now for a panel discussion. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Um, and to be here. <laughs> uh, Andy, come on back in. Uh, but uh, while we're waiting for him, uh, Diane, let's take uh, the first question. Who would you yep. like to speak to? Sure. Um, I'm going to start with one that's just come in and it's a big topic. It's Shelley Bay. It's from Kenny Jean. Morena team, re Shelley Bay and surrounds, are you in a position to be able to consider a completely different proposal or vision for the area? And we had lots of questions about Shelley Bay and people wanting a bit of an update, status report, what's the plan? So um, over to the panel and perhaps Andy, you start with that. Uh, Andy, I'm not sure is uh, in just yet, but uh, just uh -huh. let me know who would who would like to take that question. I'll start. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so look, Shelley Bay has been one of the most problematic um, decisions I think Council made. So at the moment, uh, our staff are preparing um, some information for us about the options going forward, um, and they have actually also started to think about the road. So I'm aware that they are thinking very carefully about what they can do with the road to make it better for active modes for cycling and walking, regardless of what happens at Shelley Bay. And we also have a proposal to have a one-way um, traffic lane around uh, Shelley Bay going from Shelley, uh, going from the Trockfish Cafe right round to Scorching Bay and allowing a lot more space for people to walk and cycle because we're aware of the fact that's been really enjoyed um, at present. So it's a, at the moment we can't really have, I don't think it's possible for us to say exactly what's going to happen at Shelley Bay. We're waiting on some um, legal and um, engineering advice around costs, around options for the road and around our actual options about decisions going forward. Sean, did you have something else to add to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I felt the decision of the previous council led by the previous mayor was a poor one. Uh, we shouldn't be putting more high density building in the Miramar Peninsula until we clear up the congestion that goes every day from the airport through to the Basin Reserve. Currently, in reality, uh, we are waiting on a paper that will give us advice on whether we should be selling land that uh, is possibly needed for the Shelley Bay development. Uh, if it is needed, it's uh, an opportunity to maybe have a rethink. Uh, if it's not needed, then 
uh, it, it seems a bit silly to, um, to to try and stop the development. So um, I think that's going to be coming in the next uh, month or two. So that will, that will be the, the next step. As for the one-way system around um, the chocolate from the chocolate fish in Shelley Bay through to Scorching Bay, uh, that's an absolute nonsense. It should be stopped. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Andy. Yeah, look, uh, thanks. I'm oh, sorry, I've, um, some, obviously some technical issues in terms of the quality of the um, uh, of the connection, so hopefully it's better now. Um, look, my view's always been that um, uh, the, the development is too large in this particular uh, site and that, that it, the road will struggle and there's a safety issue there, uh, and that we should be thinking about uh, Shelley Bay and the peninsula, the, the Watts Peninsula um, land as a whole, uh, and that should be done in consultation with the wider community. That's, that's still my view. Uh, and if there's a way of managing to achieve that through this uh, challenging process, and I think there's a few more challenges yet to come, mm -hmm. uh, then that's uh, what I'm keen to do. I hear more to come. Uh, Terry, final if I could just, If I could just jump in there as well, um, given this is quite a topical um, and very complex issue, I want to acknowledge that as well. For me, it's not uh, very black and white, but I, but I do have confidence that we will be receiving really good advice on the issue. And um, and the other thing for me that's pretty top and important is working with Taranaki Whanui, the iwi that's involved as well. But um, yeah, kia ora and, and mihi to a few of the other responses as well. Mm -hmm. Kia ora. Thank you. So definitely more to come on that and more debate. Uh, Diane, next yep. question, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so this one's coming from Roger just now also. Um, with increasing numbers of people likely to work from home at least some of the week, how do you see that affecting the suburbs and is the City Council looking at this issue? So we had other questions along the lines of um, supporting businesses also. So um, I think, uh, I, who on the panel would like to talk about this one? Probably all would. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose a couple of you. So let's start with uh, you, Sarah and Terry. Yeah. Well, I actually think um, when when we moved into COVID, we all suddenly realised um, how important our local areas were. And actually, for myself, I was really grateful that we had decent streets, street lighting, clean water, um, and local shops. So I think it's really important that we do support our local businesses. Um, we've got great businesses in the eastern suburbs, both in Miramar and Kilburnie. Um, we, we really need to value those. Um, we not, I think this is going to be a drive towards appreciating what's what we've got locally and how um, important and special it actually is. Terry. I might actually chuck that one over to the Mayor because I know that he's been working with different businesses. He might be able to, I'm confident he'll give a better Thank answer you. than me on that. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's, there's two elements to this. One is the appreciation of our local communities. And actually, I was just talking to uh, one of our local business people uh, yesterday, and uh, one of the things that they talked about was um, being able to tell more of the stories of our, of our local communities. And um, there is uh, apparently the, um, a big uh, screen with a historical, uh, um, uh, you know, look at what, you know, what Miramar looked like um, in the doctor's uh, surgery. Um, at least it was there, and you know that's that's part of telling our story. So I think the, the ability to appreciate our local our local business community and our local communities, are, I think, has been one of the the, uh, the silver linings to, to COVID. The other part is um, that we're going to have to think at a at a higher level of what this all means for our movement and of what it means for where people choose to live, um, because uh, you know it may be that we go back to what we used to do, or it may be that some people choose to do things differently. You know, some businesses, people might say, well, I'm going to go into work three days a week and I'm going to stay at home two days a week in Zoom. So, you know, uh, that would have a significant impact on our transport system. So we're going to have to get that crystal ball working. Uh, and Sean, I know this is an important issue to you too, so I'm just going to open it up. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, um, so working remotely is not a new thing. People have been doing it all around the world for a long time. Um, but, you know, with COVID-19, the possibilities have really been shown to to work. So I know that a lot of the civil service, uh, 50 to, to, to maybe 70 percent of people are staying working at home. We are at the Wellington City Council. Um, that said, I know the Todd group have brought, uh, will have most of their people back in the city. I mean, I think the the thing that we need to realise is all those businesses in Lampton Quay, Featherston Street and so forth really depend on people commuting right. into the city for work. 
and uh, and I, there's also a lot of people who don't really like they like to be with people like people around you so I think that the medium term view will be that most of us will go back into the city to work um, and, and that'll be good for our local businesses. Um, I don't think that the Wellington City Council's answer should be pop up cycleways. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Diane, next question. Yep. Uh, this one's from Vivian. Uh, I'm going to point it to you in the first instance, Terry. How are we going to face climate change and sea level rise in particular? Wellington has so many vulnerable areas to sea level rise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you for your question. Um, obviously, climate change is a, is a really big issue for our, for our city as it grows and as we progress. Um, there are a few really awesome things on the go. So um, within our annual plan, we're looking at um, home energy audits for, to allow people to, to keep their warms home and dry, which we know will be impacted by climate change. Another thing that we're looking at is a whole bunch of water infrastructure as well. That's a big chunk of the budget. And then um, a few other things around it, protecting our beautiful natural taonga and our natural environment and creating that green network throughout the city. We know that it's um, it's a fantastic asset as well if we're looking at it um, through the lens of the economy, but also in community and well-being too. So um, you can you can feel pretty safe and secure that that um, certainly the majority of council and and um, and the mayor himself are, are really strong in advocating for the environment and climate change on that one. Uh, if there's any one of you who would like to add anything to that, I think um, yeah, I'd, I'd, Sean, I'd, I'd Sean like to should. Mm. Sean, thank you, Sean. So, so the rate of sea level rise hasn't materially changed in the last since my dad went to St Pat's Town in the 1950s and 60s. So it is rising. Um, but but not an alarming accelerated rate. Uh, but nevertheless, it is. We need to put that into our plans and understand that, and it will probably accelerate. Uh, in terms of the amount of water, in terms of actual climate changing, the indicators are a little bit um, odd, actually, because our models that NEWA produced tell us we should be getting a lot more water and rain, but actually we're not. Uh, the observations are showing we're not. In fact, our wind gust strengths have actually dropped. So there's a bit of uh, a, a bit of a disconnect between what is being predicted and what we're actually seeing. But nevertheless, we need to be cautious and we need to be uh, uh, take a long-term view. And we should be looking at decarbonisation initiatives. And uh, I am leading that charge uh, with uh, waste to energy um, types of. Uh, projects and looking at hydrogen as a low a low carbon um, you know motor vehicle um, fuel if I can just Thank add you. something I think there's Thank two you. aspects to the climate change there's one where which is um, mitigation which is where we try to reduce the amount of carbon we're, we're making um, we can only do so much of that there's also adaptation which is where we try to deal with the effects of rising climate and that's really important for our city our infrastructure needs to be resilient to the effects of sea level rise, but also um, slope stability is another thing. Um, so there's, uh, in our budget, we've got quite a few million, I think about four million for stabilising the NIO. Um, it's a, uh, the, um, is it, help me out, Andy, it's up in the western suburbs of NIO Gorge Road. Oh, no, I think NIO Gorge, if, yeah. if only it was only four million. Yeah, <laughs> but quite a lot of money does get spent and you'll see it around Shelley Bay as well. Um, new walls going in all the time to protect our, our roads and our city from slips and from the effects of storms and all of um, the things that a, a less stable climate will bring. So two aspects, one to try and reduce what the impacts and the other to try and deal with the impacts and both are really important. Thank you. Fantastic broad answers. So. Um, Diane, let's take something from a different angle. Okay. Um, Benoit, and this has come through, I'm going to take this one because we've had this from a few people as well. Um, and it's about uh, progress and timeframes or plan around uh, Te Motu Kairangi, the regional park at the north end of the peninsula. I think, Andy, you touched on that, but perhaps anything specific about that one? Yeah, well, this, there's a limit. Thank you, Benoit. Great question. Um, this is, I mean, it's an iconic, Peter piece of Wellington and it deserves an iconic solution, which is why I said that um, we need a we need a, the community and to um, the whole of Timoto Kaurangi, uh, Shelley Bay included, uh, and ideally a, a collective picture. Um, there are conversations going on with various different parties. There's not a lot I can say about that at the moment, um, other than say those conversations are happening. Uh, and um, my aim is to try and 
uh, get the uh, get the future out of the black box that it's in at the moment and into the light so that people can have a say on it because the opportunities are immense uh, for doing something really special. Lovely. Thank you, Andy. Uh, next question, Diane. Allard has just sent one in. Um, what plans do we have to encourage more cycling and walking to keep cars off the road? Ah, who would like to pick that up? Should be you, Sarah. Should be Sarah. Um, well, we have done, of course, quite a bit in the eastern suburbs, and that, I think, has been really well appreciated. Now it's finished. I know it was disruptive at the time. Um, we have uh, seven projects we've applied for under the um, COVID response um, package. Um, they are ones we think we can do quickly. Um, but of course, we're still going through the process of consulting with communities through the traffic resolution process. And we are getting a little bit of some, some concerns around those which we'll be working through. Um, but we also have a cycling master plan. Uh, it's, it's over the course of the next seven to 10 years, we plan to deliver a network right through the city. I can see my colleague, uh, Sean, shifting. Um, <laughs> look, it isn't easy doing these things. And I know more than anyone probably how hard it has, how hard you have to work to get community acceptance for them. But I think it, on the other hand, it's been so much a pleasure to actually see people using them and knowing we're giving people those extra options to be fit and active. And again, it's about reducing carbon. So, yeah, but I know there will be other views, so I'll let the other panellists um, have their say. Pick it up, Andy. Yeah, look, um, the other part to say is that uh, I mentioned Let's Get Wellington moving earlier and aiming to uh, to accelerate that. So we are in active conversations again. Part of the Shovel Ready um, bid that we put up uh, was about getting the walking, cycling and public transport initiatives under what we call city streets accelerated. Um, so <clears throat> to some degree, that's in the hands of government as to whether they're going to give us extra ability to do that. Uh, but we are certainly going to try and do everything we can as quickly as we can. There's a balance, there's always a tension there between getting stuff done quickly, and that also relates back to the whole thing of, of um, reducing our carbon emissions. Um, uh, but there's a tension between doing things quickly and the amount of engagement that we're required to do. So, But I think this council is a council that wants to get stuff done, uh, and so that's certainly my commitment to do it as fast as possible. Terry, you have something lot, to add. I'm sorry, I was going to say, a lot, of, a lot of that is taking that from the eastern suburbs, but it's taking that into the central city. We've got some stuff to do in the southern suburbs. And the north and the west need a little bit of attention too. They do. Terry. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, sure. So I just wanted to touch on the three projects that we've approved for Te Motu Kairangi, the, the um, eastern ward. So we've got um, one on Massey Road, that's the Shelling Bay to Scorching Bay, Shared Path. Then we've got the Evans Bay Parade. It's all right, Sean. Um, and we've got um, one on Onapu Road, um, Colburnie. And so the, the impact of that will be improved safety for pedestrians and cyclists um, and, and trying to make sure that everyone has a safe amount of distance to, to walk in, to be able to commute in, and still use those really important recreation spaces as well. Um, and the other the other point of it is uh, we, we don't want everyone to just start piling into the cars because of... Um, COVID restrictions would like people to use public transport, but a big part of that is making sure people can have the ability to walk and cycle when they when they choose to. And so that's what those three projects are about for, for the ward. Uh, Sean, would you like to pick this up? Yes. Yeah, I mean, getting community buy is pretty easy. All you have to do as an Eastern Ward councillor is say, we're going to build a duplicate Mount Vic tunnel. That's all you need to do to get community buy-in. If you keep shoving cycleways down people's throats, you don't get community buy-in. Um, and so I have also enjoyed walking around the street with my son and so forth, but we'd prefer to actually get in the car and drive to the rugby pitch where he's supposed to be playing Ripper rugby or going to Zealandia. I mean, there is a balance and uh, mm. we need to, to recognise that 4% of people commute on their bikes. The rest take some sort of motorised transport. And this city council is being wagged by its tail and uh, we need to stop that. Uh, a lot to be considered here and uh, opportunities for you to, to talk about this in your submissions. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Uh, Diane, next question. Okay. Um, this one is from Christina. It's a bit localised, but it's a nice one. Um, since COVID-19, the grassy area by Kilburnie Park has been used by families to fly kites and kick balls around. Given mm. this is close to, the, to a big housing complex, are there any plans to do anything with this space? Who's interested mm. in this? Local um, 
Well, I can tell you that, that we were going to be doing some consultation as a council on the future uses of that space. And maybe Terry will be able to add a bit more. I think a lot, like a lot of things, it's been slightly put on hold. Um, it was planned to keep it as green space of some description. Um, and Terry might know a little bit more because she actually does hold the natural environment portfolio. Yeah, so with this particular bit of uh, green space there, there um, similar to the regional park, there are uh, quite a few cogs in motion, but unfortunately a lot of that um, consultation and working with partners, um, Mahi has been put on hold through COVID, so hopefully we'll have an update on that uh, really soon. Awesome, thank you. We're going to take one more question before a couple of wrap-up questions, and uh, have we got uh, one for Sean? Mm. Diane? Um, yes, it's a bit specific again, but here we go. Um, this is about the Hatai roundabout, gets lots of attention. Uh, and Brian says, scrap the Hatai roundabout, loss of 12 local car parks will rip the guts out of the village, survey the residents first. Totally with you, Brian. And uh, geez, in that uh, the Foursquare is getting a petition organised and the Watai Social Club are on it, the retailers are on it. Um, and I'll be championing that uh, back to the officers at Wellington City Council. Get in touch with me. Terry. Um, if I could just jump in there as well. Uh, we've, I'm a resident of Hai Tai Tai too, and, and Sean and I have attended a couple of different meetings on this. And uh, I checked in with our officers just recently and we are planning to, um, so at the moment what they've done is they've um, gone back to the 400 people that consulted on the Hai Tai Tai roundabout last time. And uh, they're working with local business owners and they're just about to open for public engagement. So that's looking at a, um, a timeline of the, the next three months to, to go out to community, but that was put on hold for COVID. Great, thank you. Okay, a couple of questions uh, to uh, the whole panel, if you can tell us uh, in high level terms, uh, what do you as councillors see as a priority in these tough times? I'm just gonna take you around as I see you on my screen, uh, Sarah, Sean, Terry and Andy. Um, that's a really hard one, because we are in extremely unusual times, but I would say just supporting our businesses and our people uh, to get through this listening to our communities and just also seizing some of the opportunities that this COVID um, situation has provided. Thank you, Sarah. Sean. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, although some of my commentary today might be taken as divisive, actually, we get on really well as a council. And I think showing that unity is the best thing that we can do uh, for Wellingtonians. But secondly, I hold the portfolio for um, the stadium. So I'm on the board of trust and I want Wellington to host the first large spectator game of rugby uh, in New Zealand. So that's a challenge to the people on the board, to the, the staff who are very good there, to Shane, but also to Wellingtonians and the rugby community. We need to get 5,000 people safely into that stadium and then afterwards down Lampton Quay and onto Courtney Place. That will do outstanding things for our businesses. Awesome. The widow has been laid down. The challenge has been laid down. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Terry. Yeah, look, uh, my challenge for, for Wellington and as a councillor is, is, for me, the largest priority is taking care of vulnerable people. So uh, along with the natural environment portfolio, I've also got responsibility for homelessness within our city. Um, we've been able to house 100% of the on-street homeless people throughout this crisis. And my top priority is making sure that that housing is secured and that um, we are giving the, both, uh, the, the best social services to those vulnerable people because they're, they're often hit harder um, in a crisis. And that, and that involves working with business as well. So we've seen some fantastic community partnerships and it's all about um, wrapping around people to making sure that we get through this. And that's where my priority is, mobilizing that fantastic network of business, community, um, around the vulnerable and around our families. It's amazing what we can be doing in unusual times. Thank you, Terry. And uh, finally, Amir, Andy. Well, I, I'm going to echo a little bit of what Sarah said, which is, is to me, is to get a, getting behind and supporting our business and the jobs that they support through the um, through the pandemic and now the recovery. Uh, so we start drawing people back into supporting our business uh, community. And at the same time, we continue the transformation of this fantastic city into something even better. And uh, I've highlighted some of those different uh, areas of work that we're, um, we've got to focus on. You have, you have. 
I'm going to um, throw the final challenge to you, Andy, and this is actually a question that's been coming up across the city, is people saying, you know, why bother? Why put in a submission? It takes a lot of time. How do I know that my voice is being listened to? What have you got to say to those residents? We, we listen to everybody's voice. Um, often we're, we're not going to be able to say somebody wants black and somebody wants white. Well, we can't do both of those, but we do listen to everything that everybody says, uh, and, uh, and, and it does make a difference. Um, I've, I can point to a lot of different areas where uh, we've gone out, we've consulted, and we've changed what we have done as a result of people's knowledge, uh, the weight of public opinion sometimes. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot of people. Sometimes it's just one person will say, hey, here's what we should be doing. And the fish that's swimming in the opposite direction, sometimes the one that's swimming away from the net. So it matters, and we really do appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Uh, and uh, perhaps it might even be worthwhile um, in our frequently asked questions, uh, recording some of those places where people's uh, feedback has made a difference. Right. I think I think residents would really appreciate it, it. it. Esther, I'm sorry, I'm going to need to go because okay. I need to go and talk to a, I, I need to go and talk to a minister, folks, about some of these things which we've been talking about. Great to have you with us today. Okay, thank you thank very much. <laughs> I won't tell you which minister. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so just before we uh, close, could you bring up the um, slide deck again, Olivia? We'd like to show you how you can, oh yes. So there were some questions from today that we weren't able to answer. Uh, these are some of them. So you can expect those uh, to be answered and frequently asked questions on the Let's Talk website. Look for those, look for those. Um, you can also make your submissions. Uh, and you've heard many times today uh, um, that councillors would really like to hear from you. Range of ways, uh, the website, Let's Talk, uh, the social media opportunities, uh, you can email submissions to these uh, email addresses and there's also a dedicated consultation helpline uh, to help you with that process. So uh, you've heard some of uh, what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, these are the ways that you can submit. We'd really like to run our final poll now and hear from you what would you like to submit on. So if you could launch that for us, Olivia. Let us know uh, how or if you plan to provide feedback on the annual plan and the parking policy. And you can hit more than uh, one box here. This is uh, not single choice. So which of these are you interested in? And hopefully it will come out to more than 100%. Uh, Olivia, are we getting some responses in? Yes, our audience is piling their responses in right now and I'm just going to give people a little bit more time to click on those and let us know where they're going to be uh, giving their feedback or if they're unsure or not providing their feedback. So now that lots of those have come in I'm going to close that poll for you and share the results. Oh fantastic so we've got 40% of you over 40% over 25% uh, and 50% of you are not sure. So um, in the post uh, webinar survey, uh, if some of you have got ideas about uh, information or other ways that could uh, help you or support you to make those submissions, we'd really like to hear that in the post survey. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now um, we are coming to our closing. So it's time to say thank you very much to uh, you the panellists, uh, as well as Jenny and Andy, who aren't on screen right now. Uh, I'd also like to thank the team that stands behind this. Uh, you've heard uh, Olivia and uh, Diane, but we also have Claire and Amy in the background supporting the um, tech in the process. Uh, and of course, to you uh, who have attended, been interested enough in this, you've attended now uh, or later. Thank you very much uh, for being part of creating our beautiful city. Um, now, Andy was going to take the final karakia uh, to close us. Is there any one of you who would like to take that or would you like to leave that with me? Oh, no, I'll do that. Thank you, Sarah. If you can put the words up. Anuhia, 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 ki te ura tapanui, ki wātia, ki māma, ki nākau, te tīnana, ki te wārua, e te ara takatū. Koe rā e rongo, wakaria ake ki runga, ke wātia, ke wātia, ai rā, kua wātia. Amen. Kia ora toto, katato. Thank you very much, and we look forward to your submissions. Mātewa.